So this is going to be part two. I don't know what time exactly this cut off. I'm going to re rewind it just a little bit. And it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Basically, Bob Proctor just finished talking about how uh, the key is just to expand your awareness, which I mentioned in the very first part of the very first video. When my awareness was expanded through seeing results in the gym, everything changed. You know, my awareness became more and more and more of what's possible in my life and what's possible to be achieved by someone like myself. But it starts with expanding your awareness, and that's what we're doing here today. I'm creating this video to hopefully help you expand your awareness into what's possible. And the science of getting rich, yeah, sure, you can think about money, but it's not just about money. It's about your personal development. It's not just money. It's your health, your your relationships, right? Your your happiness. You know, a lot of people aren't happy because they aren't aware of how to become happy. So expanding your awareness, which was what we're doing today, and with these audiobooks, with these courses, with these programs, and with these videos, hopefully, uh, is going to help you become aware of what's truly possible to be able to allow you to get into the success success zone that Bob Proctor is teaching, uh, which is a way of thinking, a certain way of thinking to get you on the right track that you need to be to get to where you want to go. Our awareness keeps changing. Do you know that no one knows how much money you're capable of earning? There's no one can even guess at what you're capable of earning. We want to become aware. We're like we are because we're not aware of how to do it better. We know how to do it better. Every person in this room intellectually knows how to do a better job than they're doing. Everyone in the room knows how to earn more than they're earning, but they're not doing it. You see, having the knowledge is not the deal. Having the knowledge, I mean, I, well, I remember when I was a kid, a school teacher would say to me, Bob, why'd you do that? I'd say, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You know better. I know. Why'd you do it? I don't know. I was in the Navy. Every commanding officer, Proctor, why did you do that? I don't know, sir. What do you mean you don't know? You know better. I know. Why'd you do it? I don't know. You see, I didn't know why I was doing things. Do you know that we do things that we don't want to do? It gives us results we don't want to get. Yet we do them anyway. Do you know what addiction is? It's never getting enough of what you don't want. Wow. Addiction. Never getting enough of what you don't want. Again, a lot of people are addicted to results that they don't want. Why do we keep doing it? You see, I think when we start to see that, that's when we start to become aware of how to take control over our life. And that's really what we want to do. So you see, awareness is the big deal. We want to become aware of the obvious opportunities that are available to us. We are surrounded by opportunity. There, everywhere you go, there is an abundance. There's no shortage of opportunity. We can win, and we can win in a big way. Now, when we lack awareness, we miss the opportunity. I used to always say that, you know, the trick is to be in the right place at the right time. I've been in the right place at the right time many times in my life, but I blew it. You know why? I wasn't aware that I was in the right place at the right I had to look back at it. Think of it. There's something else. It's being aware that you're in the right place at the right time is not good enough. You've got to be aware that you're in the right place at the right time. Now, do you know that you're in the right place right now to get some information that will literally transform your life? And it's like I said, I've got license to brag about all this information because none of it's mine. I guarantee you, when you walk out of here at the end of the day, your head's going to be spinning because this is good stuff. What's holding most people back? Here's your answer. It's paradigms. Now, that's sort of a buzzword, but that is really what stops us. It blinds us. Paradigms actually blind us. Now, I'm going to get into paradigms, how they're formed, and um, what they are, and then how to change them. You see, if you get into books on psychology or psychiatry or behavioral science, you'll get a definition of a paradigm, but it's usually so big and, uh, uh, and uh, awkward that you don't understand it. The book was probably written for other psychiatrists or psychologists or behavioral scientists, and the average layperson doesn't understand it. I had great teachers, and they broke everything down into the simplest possible form. And I found out that paradigm is nothing but a multitude of habits. When you wake up in the morning, you move into action. 
There's a routine to everything you do. There's one to everything I do. If you're living with someone, you could set your clock by that person and they by you. So he said, what's holding most people back? And it's paradigms. And paradigms, to keep it very simple, are just a multitude of habits. And he used the example of when you first wake up, for example, in my life, when I first wake up, I've had this bad habit recently of immediately checking my phone, turning my phone off airplane mode and just scrolling, you know? And this is something that is a paradigm because it's just a habit that's being reinforced every single morning the more I do it. But changing that paradigm can also change the course of my life and what happens and where I go. Because if I do something as simple as instead of waking up, turning my phone off airplane mode and, you know, just checking Instagram or scrolling on my phone, I could use that very first moment to instead you know pray or be thankful or think of something that i'm grateful for that i'm awake right or immediately just leave my phone there in the first place and just go do something like working out and leaving my phone off on airplane mode how much happier would i be when i put my foot in my pants i put my right foot in first i don't know which one you put in first but i do know this if i put my left in first i'd probably fall over i'd be staggering all over the place why it's programming that's how programmed we are another good example for this i don't know where i learned this from but um grab your hands like this clasp your hands like this real quick which one which thumb is over the other thumb for me my left thumb is over my right thumb now it's just automatic, it's a paradigm, it's just a multitude of habits. You've always, clasped, you've always clasped your hands like this through habit. Now, really do it the other way. Put the other thumb on top of the other, other hand. It doesn't feel as, it doesn't feel right, right? It just feels different, it doesn't feel good. It just feels different. But if you trained yourself to do it like this, the other way, eventually you would become a better or a different paradigm. We're programmed to drive the car the way we drive it. We're programmed to dress the way we dress, to walk the way we walk, to talk the way we talk. Our whole life is written program in here. And you know something? We didn't even write the program. We didn't even write the program. Do you know that there are other people's habits? Yep. You and I are the product of somebody else's habitual way of thinking. It's genetic and it's environmental. Why do you think you look like your relatives? Do you think it's an accident? It's what's programmed right into the genes at birth. If we grow up and we live that way, why do we speak the language we speak? Do you know that if you had been taken out of your home and moved to the suburbs of Beijing when you were an infant, you'd be fluent in Chinese and have absolutely no knowledge of the English language. But by the same token, if somebody had been taken out of Beijing, put here, same thing would have happened. We're programmed with other people's prejudices. We're programmed with their limitations. Do you know that most of the limitations we've got, we don't even know where they started. Exactly. Throughout my whole life, you know, I never came from the richest family or the most wealthy family or the most successful family, right? But I wasn't poor or broke either. But the habits of their thought patterns definitely reflected into my own life about specifically money or, you know, what's possible in the world. And then when I became... Uh, when I when I started surrounding myself with more you know successful people that had a lot more wealth or a lot more abundance in their life, and I noticed the way they were thinking about certain things and how it was so different than my parents' beliefs or my family's beliefs, you know, growing up or what I was programmed to believe, and the more I hung around these successful individuals, the easier it was me to shift my paradigm of what's possible to a better paradigm to their paradigm of the way they're thinking. And just like you in your life right now, you probably think that certain things aren't possible because you haven't yet become aware of it, right? Maybe it's the body you want to create or maybe it's the health you want to have or maybe it's the, the love life you want to have, right? You see other people having it, but you don't think it's really possible for you. But it's because we haven't become yet aware of that it's a reality for you because you haven't been exposed to the fact that it is a reality because your paradigm is keeping you into the programming that you've been you know, programmed to believe through someone else's habits. I'll give you an example. When, when Linda and I first met, we, we were out shopping, and uh, uh, I said, you know what I would like is turnip. She said, okay. So I picked up a turnip. And she said, what are you going to do with that? I said, I'm going to eat it. <laughs> well, she said, I'm not eating that. Well, I said, why not? She said, that's the root of the turnip. I said, it's the what? 
I had never heard it called a root. It was always just a turnip. I've never eaten a turnip, by the way. I well, I said, what do you eat? She said, we eat the green of the turnip. I said, my God, we give that to the pigs. <laughs> well, she said, we give the root to the pigs. I don't even know if I ever saw a turnip green. So here we are eating the root, giving the green to the pigs. There they are eating the green and giving the root to the pigs. Now, I was raised in northern Ontario. She was raised in uh, Pensacola, Florida, and Birmingham, Alabama. Two totally different cultures. You see? So I put the turnip back. I thought, what the hell? There's no sense in fighting over a turnip. Uh, but I'm wandering around the store, and I'm thinking, who decided we'd eat the root of the turnip? <laughs> I don't think my mother woke up one day and said, we're going to eat the root of the turnip. I wonder why she ate the root. I don't think her mother did. And then I started to think, I wonder how far back in our family I'd have to go to find out who decided we would eat the root of the turnip. How far back I'd have to go in her family to find out who would eat the green of the turnip. And then I started to think, you know, it really doesn't matter. But the principle behind this is huge. Because, you know, most of our habits are like that. They really are. Mm -hmm. Now, think of this. What do most people do when they begin to have financial trouble? That's, that's a paradigm talk that I'm dealing with here. What do they do? I'll tell you exactly what they do. They lower their standard of living to meet their income. Mm. That's a bad idea. That is a terrible idea. Timidity is not a strategy for the new economy. We're living in a new economy. Remember, you cannot move forward when you're cutting back. You cannot move forward when you're cutting back. Jeez. Oh, so simple. Yeah, I mean, right now, how easy is it for us to look at the situation in the world of the crisis that's happening right now, if you want to call it a crisis, and think of the first thing to do is reduce your expenses and and cut out a bunch of things that are aren't necessity when reality is you should be adjusting yourself to make it even more reality for you to keep those things because you can't move forward when you're cutting back it's easier said than done you know especially when you're Maybe someone that just got laid off from your job or you're maybe someone that's struggling financially right now with the economy or, you know, your, your industry is not doing so well because of the, 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 the virus and stuff. But, you know, being able to shift that paradigm and, and adjust your standard, standard of living to keep how you want to be is, is something that is, is tough to do for sure. But, um, yeah, it's like... How can you expect to keep going forward and progressing to where you want to go if you're focused on reducing? Yeah, does it? Why do we do it? We're programmed. That's what we were taught to do. Anything else is being irresponsible. Well, let's think of this for a moment. Successful people take their income up to meet their standard of living. Do you know why? They understand how to do it. And if you don't understand how to do it, you're in bad shape. But when you do understand, you don't need to cut back. Never need. I've, I've been working pretty closely with a fellow. In fact, we just come back from Europe. We were over all through Germany and over into Finland. And uh, he had uh, had a bit of trouble with money here just within the past year. And he was uh, put his house up. He was going to sell it. He said, what the hell are you selling your house for? Well, he said, I, you know, I can't afford to keep it. I said, you can't afford to sell it. to make a decision right now. Do you like the house? Yeah, I don't want to sell it. Then don't sell it. Just figure out how to earn more money. And so the two of us got working on it, and his problem was solved. Wow. It was simply a decision. Decision. Well, that's all we need. See, we're living in a new economy. The economy that you and I were raised in, that's not the economy we're living in anymore. It's a totally different world we're living in. But we're still operating with all the old habits. Mm. Now, Gates said one thing is clear. We don't have the option of turning away from the future. You don't have that option. No one gets to vote on whether technology is going to change our lives. Changing it's, it right now. It's here. This is the deal. You either fall in line with the new rules or you're going to lose.
It's that basic and it's that simple. There's nothing complicated about it. You see? Now, here's three great great questions. You, you want to you wanna remember this because this can change your life like night and day. It's so basic and so simple, you could miss it. One, what am I doing? What am I doing? Number two, what works? What works? Number three, what doesn't work? Now, when we've analyzed this, let's make up our mind that we're going to stop doing what doesn't work and take all that energy and, and, and that time and put it into what does work. Ah, man. Oh. What am I doing? What works? What doesn't work? It's tough to admit right now, but what am I doing? Well, number one, I just quit my job like last week. I'm a full-time entrepreneur working on my business. And my business is a YouTube advertising agency that has customers and clients that pay me every single month to help them advertise their products and services on YouTube. That's my full-time business, um, the business that I'm building. What I'm also doing is creating videos on YouTube that are gonna be very, very great in the long run, but I'm also dabbling and, and, and not spending as much time on it, but I'm trying to also create a health and wellness product and services and all this stuff, and it's not, it's not really working yet, right? But what is working is the YouTube advertising agency, and it's like, that's working, it's making me money, and then what's not working? What doesn't work? Well, what, what's not working yet is the, the, you know, the health and fitness brand because in terms of it's not making money as much as the YouTube advertising agency yet. And he's saying cut off what doesn't work and do more of what does work. And it's so simple, but my, my, my ego doesn't want to just double down on my YouTube advertising agency because I love creating personal development videos like this and I'm not going to stop doing that, but I do need to double down more on the YouTube advertising business and put the health and wellness on hold just a little bit while I can build the business up to where I can eventually have more time to focus on this. <sighs> Do you know if that's the only thing you got out of this entire meeting this afternoon, it could be worth millions to you. Damn. Literally millions. So what are you doing right now, you know? What's your goal, right? Did you take the time to write down the goal and when you wanna have it? That's a good call to action right now to pause this video and, and really ask yourself, you know, what, what do you want? When do you want to have it? And write it down and look at it every single day and then ask yourself, what am I doing, right? What am I doing right now? And what's working that I'm doing? <laughs> well, what doesn't work, right? So if you're someone that wants to lose about 10 pounds of body fat or gain 10 pounds of muscle, right? If you're not eating enough, and you're working out three to, three to four times a week, and you're knowing that getting, you're getting stronger in the gym, but you're not eating enough, you know, well, what's working is you're working out. What's not working is you're not eating enough. So do more of, of what's working. Well, yeah, for sure, work out, but how can you change that? And now eat, eat more, right? It's kind of the worst example I think I've ever given in my entire life, but I think you guys get the point. I picked this up, I don't know if I heard it or I read it, but there was a man at an engineering company he did about 10 million a year. It wasn't a big company, but it wasn't a corner store. And he died. His wife had nothing to do with the business. She never went around the business. So everybody just assumed when he died, she would sell the business. But she didn't plan to sell the business. After the funeral and things slowed down, she went into the company and she called all the heads of departments in and they're the three questions she asked. What are you doing? What works, what doesn't? She told them to stop doing what didn't work, spend the time at what does work, and she took the sales from 10 million to 25 million. She just went in every now and then. That's all she ever did. I wonder what would happen if that's all we did. We want to understand and apply if we really want to get into the science of getting rich, the law of compensation. Now, the law of compensation is pretty clear. There's nothing complicated about it. The law of compensation clearly states that the amount of money you earn 
is always going to be in direct ratio to the need for what you do, your ability to do it, and the difficulty there would be in replacing you. I want to repeat that one more time. Clear. There's nothing complicated about it. The law of compensation clearly states that the amount of money you earn is always going to be in direct ratio to the need for what you do. The amount of money you earn is always going to be in direct relationship. I forget what he said. Clear. There's nothing complicated about it. The law of compensation clearly states that the amount of money you earn is always going to be in direct ratio to the need for what you do. Your ability to do it and the difficulty there would be in replacing your ability to do it the amount of difficulty in replacing you The law of compensation, the amount of money you earn is always going to be in direct ratio to the need for what you do, your ability to do it, and the amount of difficulty in replacing you. Now, you see, if we really study this, there's probably quite a need for what you do. Now, I don't know how proficient you are at doing it. Most people learn how to do something, and then they never improve upon it from that point on. Once we learn how to do it, we just keep doing it at that level. That's why most people read at a grade 7 level. They never learn how to improve upon it. You see? Hmm. The third one, the difficulty there will be in replacing it. So, you see, if you analyze this, you're going to realize that if you just focus on number two, number three is going to take care of itself. Number one's already taken care of. There's probably a great need for what you do. Now, if we become very, very good at what we do, just keep perfecting what we do. If we sell, let's really learn how to sell. Keep getting better at it. You would become very difficult to replace. Now, I've always felt for salespeople, and I would imagine quite a few of you are in sales, you want to learn to master your presentation. Most people make a terrible sales presentation. Just absolutely terrible. That's why they don't do very well. I have gone into companies and watched sales grow up by hundreds of millions of dollars and we tell the people not to work as hard. See, we've got the idea in our mind, if you're going to earn more, you've got to work harder. Bad idea. Now, think of this for a moment. I want you to think about your financial success. And, 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 and don't think for a second that you can't change it. You can change it. You can change it dramatically. But really think about your financial system. I'm going to pause this one right here. i got to take a massive leak right now. <laughs> so this is the end of part two. But when we come back, we'll keep continuing with part three in the next video. Um, so, yeah, i got to go.